memorize it, but you need to know what it means. Amen. So uh, I know they're they're uh, they're learning. So uh, it takes a lot of courage to get up in front of everybody to do that. All right, uh, we're in the book of Exodus. Uh, sort of try to look at a top of a topical view in a sense of some of it. We won't get bogged down in a lot of details in some places, uh, but we've uh, we see the preparation of a deliverer. Uh, we know that uh, the children of Israel have been in bondage, uh, and we know that uh, for 400 and some plus years, uh, and we know that God is in the process of raising up a deliverer, uh, and Moses will be that. It seemed as if God is, is doing nothing. Uh, again, it's been 400 years now, and a new Pharaoh has come on the scene. Uh, he's decreed that all the male children be thrown into the Nile River. And uh, the Jews prayed and cried, wondering where God's deliverance was. Uh, had they remembered his word in Genesis 3.15, uh, they would have known that that for a year, hundred years had to lapse. Okay? Uh, so uh, God promised the people of God a deliverer, and he would keep his word. Uh, but what does it take for the preparation of a deliverer? Uh, what would that deliverer look like? And what does it take in preparation for a deliverer? It takes people who are willing to make choices directed by God. Uh, and I sort of outlined this, the arrival of Moses. Let's read it and make application as we go. First of all, and there went out a man of the house of Levi and took the wife of the daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. So see the arrival of Moses. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we, what seems like would be a time of celebration for most parents now it was a time of secret. It was a time of suffering. It was a time of suppression. They couldn't announce the birth of this child because they knew that there was a death warrant out on him. And we see that uh, uh, Amram and Jochebed, uh, mother and father, he'll have some decisions to make. Uh, so we see the, the parents make the choice to conceive him uh, and keep that in mind. They make the choice even when the decree is sent out uh, by Pharaoh to conceive him. Uh, and they make a decision in their lives to honor God. Uh, to show their respect toward God. Uh, and we need to, as you think about that, uh, it's very important to realize that we have choices to make as we think about our children, as we think about um, Amram and Jochebed. They had a decision to make. Are they going to go with the culture, or are they going to honor God? So as we look at those first three verses, it says they hid him three months. He was a goodly child. But he, he, these parents chose to conceive him. And I'm glad my parents chose to conceive me, aren't you? Because that's why you're living, okay? Thank God for the parents who choose to, to bring forth those children uh, and uh, that have been conceived. I read about Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, most of you know him, was a scholar athlete. Uh, he was born to parents who were missionaries to, uh, to the uh, Filipino people. Uh, Tim's mom, Pam, had a serious complication. And the doctor suggested an abortion to be the only way to resolve the pain and the bleeding. According to the doctor, the, the mass of fetal tissue had to go. There was no option. But miraculously, the bleeding stopped, and they were able to fly to Manila, where Tim was born. A blood clot the size of Tim was delivered in that labor room. Only a small part of the, of the placenta was attached, just enough to keep Tim alive for the pregnancy, because his parents chose life. Did you stop and think about that? He went on to be a, a scholar-athlete. He went on to be the Heisman Trophy winner and then went on to the NFL. And now he's doing broadcasting. Who knows what God has in store uh, when we choose life. Amen. Uh, but we see the, the Amram and Jochebed chose, they chose to give Moses life. They chose to believe God. They knew that he was the promise of a deliverer to deliver, deliver the children of Israel out of bondage. I thought about Jochebed for just a moment. We'll, we'll come back to her. But uh, they chose, secondly, uh, to protect him. Uh, notice it says in this text that they, when they saw him, when she saw him, that he was a goodly child. There was just something about him. He, he, he had the reflection of God. That word goodly means that he was something unique about him. 
Now keep in mind uh, that they already had two children. They had Miriam, who was about eight years old, and they had, a, they had Aaron already, who was about three years older than Moses. So as you keep in mind, they already had children, but there was just something unique about this child. Uh, and we know that they chose to protect him because he was, a, he was goodly. He was good. There was something about him that was pleasant. There was something about him that was agreeable. Not that the other two children weren't, but they knew that in this season that God had brought him forth for a divine reason. And it made them happy to know that they were going to be honor God and God was going to use him. They chose, to, thirdly, to progress him. Uh, and the life of Moses is representative of the drawing power of God. God only, only providentially drew him out of Egypt. But progressively, he drew Egypt. Listen, he drew him out of Egypt. Progressively, he drew Egypt out of him. But then he sent him back to Egypt. If you study his life, okay, uh, he sent him back. Purposefully used in drawing the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. So keep in mind that the, the first ten verses cover Moses' uh, first 40 years in the second chapter. Uh, so as you look, look at that time frame, keep that in mind. Well, stop in just a moment. We, we see, secondly, we see the adoption of Moses. As you remember the story, it says that they laid him in the Flags River bank, but they made an ark of bulrushes in verse 3, and they dabbed it with slime and pit. Well, where did they learn to do that at? Where did they learn to do that? They, they remembered the story of Noah's Ark, didn't they? The exact same thing he did. They knew the story of the Bible. They knew that this ark, this, this, this uh, cradle, so to speak, or this, this crib or, or, uh, was made of ark of bulrushes. And they, as they dabbed it, it was slime with pitch. Uh, they knew the history of Moses and what had happened uh, back in the days of Noah when, when God's people had been spared. As Moses wrote down, remember Moses is writing by rote memory the book of Exodus. He's telling the account of his life testimony. And he's telling uh, the, the, the history of Israel. And as we keep that, first of all, as we see, as we move to verse 4, and it says, And his sister stood afar off to watch what would be done to him. As they, she laid his mother laid Moses uh, in this uh, ark that was built of bulrushes. She had prepared it, and then she noticed the phrase. It says she put the child therein. Uh, the idea here is that she strategically, particularly placed him in this in this uh, ark of bulrushes. And then we move in verse three. We look over words sometimes. That word "laid" is an interesting word, and she laid. It in the flags of the river, in the very edge, where the where the, sometimes the 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 flags in the river's bank sometimes grow six to eight foot tall. But she did that in a purpose, maybe to hide him and protect him. But as I done a little research, it, it, there's something interesting. As you dig and you think about this uh, particular text, uh, keep in mind that there was that river, the Nile River, was a a uh, river that was known for crocodiles. Uh, and there was a particular uh, plant there that they could get the juice off of, and they could anoint this ark or this basket to keep anything from happening, and, and it would draw away the insects, and it draw away uh, uh, crocodiles or, or, and uh, those hostile animals that would have devoured him. It, it was uh, made out of that wood to keep him protected. So we see God in his sovereignty working in every bit of this situation. It's not so much about Jochebed and, and uh, Miriam. It's not, about, it's not so much about them. The storyline is about what God's doing. God's sovereign and God's working through these people's lives to bring forth a deliverer. And, and the things, things true with you and I, God's working through your life and my life to show people another deliverer, that being of Jesus Christ. Amen. So they chose to progress him. And we in this adoption of Moses, it begins to take place in verse 5 through verse 9. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. Now, the reason she's doing that is because many of these people believed in the, in the Nile River. They believed if they spliced the water of the Nile on them that it had uh, uh, fertility powers. They, they believed that the, the uh, god of fertility uh, resided at the Nile. Uh, they worshipped this particular river, and they had several gods that they bowed to. And they believed that they come and spliced themselves with that water or bathed in that water that they would be able to give, give birth to a child. So that's why she's coming, and that's what's taking place. And if she come. 
to wash herself at the river, her maidens walked along by the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Verse 6 says, And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. His complexion was very clear of his nationality, of who he would be, uh, probably a different complexion than theirs. And then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I'll give thee wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Wow. You're talking about the sovereignty of God. Wow. Uh, we see one daughter's curiosity uh, here in this text as you begin reading. In verse 4, we see, this, we see that, uh, <clears throat> that Miriam stood afar off. Uh, she's curious, uh, going to see what happens to him. And then the daughter of Pharaoh comes. We see, uh, we see a, a, another daughter's compassion. We see a daughter's curiosity. We see one's compassion. But thank God in the midst of it, we see another daughter's celebration. She watches and she sees God's sovereignty uh, as Pharaoh's daughter uh, asked uh, for a nurse to be called. And this so happens, guess what? The nurse goes uh, and we find that the child's own mother was called to take care of the child. Now what are the odds of that? Think God might be working behind the scenes, and she's going to be able to nurse him and take care of him and raise him, even in Pharaoh's court. Uh, the adoption of Moses, a mother's celebration. You see, as I think about Jochebed for just a moment in the storyline of this particular account, there's some things that we can't we can't avoid as we look at her, and particularly for the women the, the, the women here, but also for the men. First of all. Uh, we, we have to see her, first of all, notice her credentials back in verse 1. She is an Israelite. She's of the tribe of Levi. She, listen, she is linked to the family that, listen, is of the priestly, have the priestly duties in the tabernacle and that of worship. We see her credentials. We see her courage in verse 2. Uh, when she can see, she bare the son, and, and she hid him three months. Now, we... There's many speculations as why or how she hid him three months, but she did. Uh, don't know how she kept him from crying and screaming. And uh, when he went through all those things, that you know how they go through uh, in the three-month period. But she did hid him, and she protected him. So we see her courage. We know that her life could be taken. They could have, Pharaoh could have had her executed, but she was. She see her courage. Then we see her confidence as you see verse 3 and verse 9 and verse 10. We see her confidence uh, when she no longer hid him. She made this ark of bulrushes and, and, and dabbed it with slime and pitch. And she laid it very carefully in the flags by the river's brink. You see, we see her confidence. You know what she's doing? She's saying, God, you gave me this child, and now I'm going to give him to you. I'm trusting you with his providence. I'm trusting you with his direction. God, you gave him to me, but now I'm going to give him to you. I'm trusting you with his well-being. Folks, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, and you know as well as I do, when your kids get older, you, you send them out and you trust them, and you try to do everything you can to teach them to walk by faith, to trust God, to live for Jesus. But listen, then when they get out there, you don't know what they're going to do. Uh, it's, not, it's not up to you. They have their own decisions. But I see her confidence. She's confident enough to know that God is sovereign. She, she trusts his providence. And she says, Lord, all the way I know to protect him is to put him in this ark and to put him in the Nile and, and to preserve him and to do everything I can do to protect him. Well, we see her confidence. We also can't help but to see her charity. And there in verse 9 and verse 10. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I'll give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child. But how about that? You're going to get paid to, for taking care of nursing your own kid. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And, and notice verse 10, the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Well, uh, as we begin to see here, uh, we see her life, her compensation. Her son would become the greatest leader probably ever to be known to the Jewish people outside Jesus Christ. Uh, Moses was a, that 
renowned patriarch that we're reading about tonight and we can follow, that God entrusted him uh, to lead the children of Israel uh, for many, many years to that promised land. But look at verse 11. We see the assertion of Moses. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren. He looked on their burdens and, and he spied the Egyptians, smiting uh, Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and he looked that way. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him uh, that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. As we read that, I want you to keep in mind, uh, Moses, what's happening here? Moses has to learn that deliverance must come in God's time and in God's way. Now, I know there's a lot of different theories about this. And many say, well, Mer uh, Moses is guilty. Of Mo Mo Moses is trying to resolve conflict. He, see, he, is, he is standing in the gap for one of his own people that are being misused and abused and they're being threatened. And he steps up, okay, and he is in protection mode here. He doesn't intentionally kill this guy. He's protecting his own people. Uh, and and he's, he's standing here and he's standing ground for somebody that's been taken advantage of. He's taken, uh, taken, they're being taken advantage of and he sees it happening and he's trying to solve the conflict that's going on. Uh, he's trying to use conflict resolution and it goes to the point where uh, he literally takes the other person's life. So then that puts him in a scare because everybody knows about it now. But as you read this story, Moses never intentionally murdered this gentleman he had the fight with. He was protecting one of his own people uh, in self-defense, okay? Uh, and they said, Who made thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. You see, they didn't know the whole story. And he knew that if Pharaoh got word of this, it would be difficult times. So then there we see the abs absenting of Moses in verse 15. When he heard this thing, he fled from the face of Pharaoh, and he dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Well, keep in mind, as you think about the first 40 years of, of his life, <laughs> we find Moses learning to wait on the mighty hand of God. You see, had he handled this situation different, he wouldn't be on the run. If he'd have waited on God, even though he was in protection mode, trying to help one of his own people. Listen, what happened in, in his counsel to these other two, they turned on him. What about that? I understand if he, but if we go back to the whole, you see, somebody said faith has its refusals, and, and, and these refusals lead to rewards. Moses was too hasty in his actions, and God set him aside for further training. That probably could be true. Uh, he wasn't ready to be the leader he made it, needed to be. And, and we see that he takes this journey, and, and he tries to depart for, really from the will of God. And, and for 40 years of his life, we find him lear he's learning to wait on the hand of God. And let me just say, God never lays hands on his servants suddenly. He takes time to develop men and women of God to be what they want them to be. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote about in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 6. He told the church not to lay hands on any, any man that's a novice, somebody that's a new believer. Why? Because they're not ready for it. They're not ready for the pastor. They're not ready for leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. If you remember what Paul wrote to young Timothy there as well, uh, he, he made a statement there, and I'm, if I can flip over there, I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> in chapter 5, verse 22, you can... Jot that down. I didn't put it in your notes. But listen to what he said. He said, lay hands. There's what I've just told you. Lay hands silly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 6, uh, he makes sort of the same statement. He says, for if a man not know how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. Okay? A new believer. Okay? Lest being lifted up of pride, he falls into condemnation of the devil. So, 
Satan knows how to set traps for all of us, and that's why we got to mature and develop and grow. But in the abs- in the absenting of Moses, God's doing some things. Okay, He's working in his life. All right, but look at verse sixteen through verse twenty-two. Watch what happens. We find that Pharaoh heard this thing, and Moses fled, and he's gone down the median, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs of the water of their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. That tells you right there what kind of guy he is, okay? Uh, keep on. And when they came to rule their father, he said, How is it that you've come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? And why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Uh, evidently he may not have had too much male help all right uh so anyhow moses was content to dwell with the man and gave moses zephora his daughter and she bare him a son and he called his name gershom for he said i have been a stranger in a strange land and we'll we'll move on right there a little in the rest of the chapters we pick up all right so keep in mind here's the here's the fact of where we got thus far stop and think about it for a moment okay uh if Moses is to lead the people of God out of bondage, he has to be able to relate to them, doesn't he? He has to be able to relate to them. Uh, and in order to minister to the family, he must have a family. All right? Stop and think about that. In order to be a shepherd, uh, people must learn the role of a shepherd. If you're going to be a shepherd, you've got to learn the role of a shepherd. He hasn't been a shepherd yet. He's growing in age now. Okay, And while the deliverer is being readied for the people, the people are being readied for the deliverer. As you read verse 23 through verse 25, God's getting things ready. He's getting everything where it needs to be through Moses' life, through Israel's life. Verse 23 says, And it came to pass in the process of time, notice that, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. You know, Sometimes we think God doesn't hear us just because he doesn't do something right then. We think God's not paying us attention because he doesn't resolve our conflict or our trouble or our difficulty right then. But listen, God doesn't get in a hurry. He seldom gets in a hurry. He's always on time, matter of fact. And verse 24 says, And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. In other words, he acknowledged them. He heard them. He knew what they were going through. He knew what they were facing. Listen, and he, he's getting them uh, he, them where they need to be. He's getting Moses where he needs to be. Listen, one Pharaoh's passed off the scene. Uh, uh, he's died, and now there's a, another leader coming on the scene. You see, God doesn't do everything all at one time. God works in seasons of your life. He works in seasons in a country. He works in seasons. And all through the scripture we see him working in seasons. You see, Moses is going to uh, go from a, a prince to a shepherd to a leader. But he's got to go through these segments of these 40 years to get to where God wants him. Now, keep in mind, again, his, his life is divided, as we said, in 40 different 40-year 40 periods. 40 in Egypt, 40 in Midian. And then we find the, the, the other 40 uh, were uh, serving God and the Israelites. In the first 40 years, he thought he was a somebody. In his second 40 years, he learned he was a nobody. And the last 40 years, he discovered God was somebody who could use a nobody to do anything in his service. I went back and I thought about that. You see, he became a liberator. He became a lawgiver and he became a leader. But it all started when his parents preserved his life. It all started when they put him in that ark and put him in those bulrushes and trusted God by faith. I come to a couple of different things as I was looking through this again. Uh, and by way of conclu- conclusion tonight, we're sort of opening the door to this. We see uh, this the beginning. Uh, Warren Wiersbe said this, when you think about them uh, hiding him for the, the amount of time he did and, and you see Pharaoh's daughter going out by the river here to uh, worship a pagan system uh, they, these folks really, literally worship the Nile okay there's more than one God that they look to but here she is and, 
Warren Wiersbe said this, said a baby's tears were the first weapon God used in his war against Egypt. Think about that. A baby's tears were the first weapon God used in his war against Egypt. And how true that is, if you stop and think about it. God was strategically, sovereignly, providentially working behind the scenes to bring forth Moses to, to bring the children of Israel out of bondage. You see, sometimes we don't understand all, everything God's doing in our life when he saves us. I can look back now and I can see things before I gave my heart and life to Christ, uh, where, he, where I was raised, the family I came from, uh, some of the friends we had, some of the uh, relationships and so on and so forth. And even after I was saved, I see some of the people God strategically put in my life. And, and all in different places, you, you're able to go back and you see those places where God was working providentially. I, I don't think any of us sometimes we we don't see in present tense uh, the the providential working of God. Many times the, the providence of God, we look back to see the providence of God working in our lives. But I'm sure you could tell me as well like I, I can tell you some places in your life where you knew God strategically and providentially worked to put you in the situation or the family or the job or education or whatever it was to get you to where he where you are right now. You see the thing about it is is we things happen in our life and we don't ever we don't relate them to God. And if we're going to walk by faith, we got we got to we got to trust in his providence. We got to see his sovereignty and we've got to relate things to God. And then let me make another statement here as I look at this second chapter. I believe the servant of God ought to learn all that he can about God, dedicate it to God and faithfully serve God. Moses is going to have to learn that. You see, he is in a place, he's in a position now that he's got himself in a predicament and he's on the run. But let me remind you, just like old Jonah, when we're on the run, God's one step ahead of us, okay? And God was one step ahead of Moses throughout the whole book. He was one step ahead of Israel. And then thirdly, I believe... Moses, I believe he was a compassionate man who was sincere about his motives, but he was impetuous, impetuous in his actions. I believe he really cared about that guy that was get, that 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 uh, fellow Hebrew that was getting beat beat that day. He he had to be he was a compassionate man. He was sincere in his motives. He just handled it the wrong way, and it backfired on him. Been there. I got that T-shirt, don't you? <laughs> And we've got to be careful sometimes how, how our motives. And, and what happened was he became impetuous in his actions. He jumped ahead of God. He took things in his own hands. He's trying to resolve a conflict himself, and he can't resolve that conflict. Listen, he does, and he does it the wrong way, and it ends up being costly. But God can take our messes, amen? He can take our messes and make them successes. And we see that right in the very beginning of this story. Well, and I believe the, the fourth thing that we see so far is Moses had to learn that deliverance would come from God's hands and not his hands. That's so so true now. We, we see that right here tucked away and throughout this book. He had to learn that deliverance would come from God's hands and not his hands. You see, that's why as he t attacked this fellow Hebrew, he he's trying to, put things in his hands and not God's hands and we're all guilty of that let's be honest sometimes it's because we don't we're not sensitive to his direction of the Holy Spirit sometimes it's not because we're following the leading of the word sometimes it's because we're not praying sometimes it's because we don't wait long enough sometimes it's just because we aren't we aren't sensitive to, to enough to the voice of God but we need to be reminded as we open this second chapter, we, we begin to dive into his life. Man, there are so many avenues and so many routes and so many life applications you can make off of his life. And even in this second chapter, but we do know a couple things. Number one, God is, we serve a providential God. You see, you're here tonight. I'm here by the providence of God. God has a plan 
for all of our lives. God didn't call me to be Moses. He called me to be Danny Laws. He didn't call me to be Charles Stanley or Adrian Rogers or, or any of those other guys that are dead that are gone off the scene. He didn't call you to be whoever you are. He didn't call you to be your daddy, your mama. He didn't call you to be anybody except who he wants you to be. He wants you. He made you unique. He gave you spiritual gifts. He gave you abilities. He gave you the freedom and the choice to think and make decisions for yourself and, and let him operate and work in and through your lives so that you can honor him and please him doing the will of God for your life. That sort of opens this second chapter. So as you think about your life, as you think for just a moment, every one of us have or we have importance with God. No matter where we come from, no matter what our background, what our history might be, God loves us, and he has a providential plan for our lives. It's our responsibility to seek it. It's our responsibility to wait on God and to let him show us where he's working and what he wants to do in our lives. If there's anything we see out of that second chapter, I believe, I believe that's a basic thought tonight that we get from that. We have to learn that deliverance comes from God's hands and not ours. When you and I try to fix, when we try to fix the situation, most of the time we make a mess. Amen? Amen? But with God's help, we can do all things through Christ. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. So that's just some of the nuggets out of this second chapter tonight that we find. But I hope that you'll latch on to a few of them uh, as we move into this third chapter. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the the third chapter. Uh, and uh, that's the chapter I'll share some personal testimony, how God used that in my life uh, and the timing that he used it. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought about that back in the arrival of Moses. Who would ever thought that, a, that we know that a, that a, a bringing the child forth at the time of celebration, don't we? It ought to be. But, you know, it's almost getting like it was then as you stop and think about the culture and the way things are happening. What ought to be a time of celebration has become a, a time of sorrow and a, and a time of suffering as we see many of the children today that aren't given a chance to live. I wonder what what... What child was aborted that was the next Billy Graham? What child was aborted that would be the next Charles Stanley or the next Adrian Rogers? You see, we don't know the sovereignty and the providence of God. And that's why we ought to do everything we can to fight against abortion. We ought to do everything we can to stand against those and, and to help to preserve life. Because we don't know. Listen, that next child that's life saved might be our preserver. Amen? He might be that one that is to help us through uh, the, the next generation through some of the things they're facing unless Jesus comes. You'd have to agree with me as I stand here tonight. Our world's in a mess. It's a, in a mess, and it's rapidly declining all around us. But somewhere, somewhere, uh, I don't know, but there, there, there's a deliverer. There's a deliverer, uh, and we see that deliverer is Moses is the type of the deliverer of that being Jesus Christ he came to be our deliverer well I'm going to stop right there there's so much in here I go different directions get you confused if we're not careful but as we think about the scripture make an application out I'm going to have Daniel come and play if you will Chris I want to ask you to sing since you're stuffy there let's all stand tonight maybe tonight you're praying and you're waiting on God about a situation or a circumstance in your life and maybe you're tempted to take things in your own hands I don't know where you're at have you prayed about it have you sought God have you laid it in this altar or your altar at home and said God I need you I need you to take care of this help me take my hands off of it Lord and you you put your hands on it maybe it maybe it's a financial problem maybe it's a marital problem maybe it's a financial problem I could go on and on and on with whatever it may be it may be, a, it may be a physical problem maybe you just need to come and get in this altar and say Lord I'm just trusting you I know that you're a sovereign God and I believe you're working providentially in my life and help me not to get discouraged help me not to get defeated but help me keep my eyes on you help me to have the 
courage of Jochebed. Help me to live with her with a confidence like she had. Help me to show charity. Uh, help me to help me to be that that I need to be. That I have the credentials of God in my life. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the truths of this second chapter. As we make our journey through this book, I pray you speak to us individually, speak to us collectively. And Lord, we're so glad tonight, Lord. I, we don't know uh, what the we don't know what, what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And we know that you're a sovereign God. We know that there's some things in our life that are, have happened providentially, and we know there'll be some other things that are in the providential will of God for our lives. And we pray, Lord, tonight that you'd open our hearts. Lord, I pray for that one that may be discouraged and defeated, or that one that's trying to resolve things on their own, whatever it may be, financially, uh, whatever the physically, mentally, emotionally. Lord, I pray tonight, Father, that we could uh, cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. May we just trust you tonight with our well-being in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.